Hello and welcome to episode 165 of True Potentials, Do More With Your Money Show. Today I'm joined by some of my colleagues from the investment team. We've got Paul, George and Matt. And what we wanted to do today is to really reflect on the past five, six weeks in markets, really since we last did um, an investment management podcast. Indeed, I think it was episode 160. And what we were discussing then was the challenges in in the banking sector. We'd come through two weekends of quite dramatic news with the collapse of two banks in the US, Signature Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, and then the rescue the following weekend of Credit Suisse by UBS. And there was certainly a lot of volatility in asset markets at that time. But one of our key messages was also that really that volatility was at such extreme levels, it was very difficult to to take um, action um, potentially for individual investors as a result. And I just wanted maybe to bring Paul in at that point and to think about and maybe to give some context to that volatility that we were seeing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So when we looked at volatility, where we saw um, a real spike in volatility was in the bond markets. Uh, still, there was a, a lot of volatility in equities, but particularly bonds. It was a, we saw a 13 standard deviation event, which is you know quite technical, um, but we saw the amount of volatility, which was more than what we saw in the financial crisis back in 2000, 2008, more than what we saw in the COVID period as well. Um, So very difficult to do anything in those types of periods. We just hold off, look at the market, assess the situation. And we did see um, central banks, the Federal Reserve, step in quite swiftly to provide liquidity, to provide support to the banks, which very quickly eased fears. And we saw um, a repricing in equity market sounding credit markets and really stable. I think you, you, you touched on something there about stepping back and, and staying calm and I suppose it's that behavioural aspect that one has to bring to bear within that, that sort of environment where it's very easy to, and the want is to try and take action but often at times that can be the worst thing to do at those points. Absolutely, it's it's very difficult to do when you see markets fall, you think oh, I need to react to this, more often than not step back, wait assess the situation, assess what policymakers are going to do, get more information, and then you can be a, a ticket, have a more informed uh, judgment and decision. And I suppose there are some real positives, if we think about it, in terms of how asset markets have, have digested that news, how, as you, you mentioned, central banks have, have dealt with that, and thinking about how asset markets just in general have, have performed yeah. since then. and. Maybe between Paul and Matt, you can just bring out how asset markets have have moved on in terms of the performance that has been delivered. And I think maybe also for our, our listeners really thinking about the, the role of multi-asset within that and how sovereign bonds in particular performed in those more stressed environments. Yeah, but I think if I kick things off, you know, equity markets have, have rallied. Interestingly, that just in the month of March, you saw equity markets up. Um, but since the start of March, you've got the S and P five hundred up uh, close to three percent, Europe up two percent. Uh, you've seen a rally in uh, corporate bonds, both in high yield bonds, but also investment grade um, as well. And also, you're seeing positive returns in, in um, sovereign bonds. So when we look year to date, you know, despite all the fears around inflation, despite the fears around interest rates. The banking crisis, you've got the S&P 500 up over 7%, the NASDAQ up over 16%. Mm. So these are very, very strong returns. It's been very narrowly led with um, the likes of uh, your FANG stocks, so that's your Facebook, your Googles, uh, Microsoft, all delivering exceptional returns. Uh, and that's not only driven by... Um, you know, improved sentiment, but actually corporate earnings, which mm. I know, Matt, you've been looking at, have, yeah. have been being very strong this week. I think the other bit, just to add on to your point there, Paul, is coming to the point you were making, Jeff, about being multi-asset investors as well, is last year was obviously a tough year for bond markets in general, with central banks continuing to raise interest rates. And some of the doubts that we've seen coming through from investors was whether actually 
bonds would continue to provide that di diversification rule. So mm -hmm. what we're pleased as a investment team to actually see is that rule of bonds offering negative correlations to equities kicking in. So when yeah. the problems with SVB um, come to light, actually bond markets yields fall, prices move higher. So we're actually getting that diversification benefit, which is crucial within a multi-asset portfolio. It was, it was certainly very evident in, in the midst of those two to three weeks in the middle of March that yeah. sovereign bonds certainly did provide the, the protection that we, we wanted them to provide in, in the context of, of multi-asset portfolios. I think the other thing there is, I suppose, even within that, if we look at other regions as well, now we've, we've talked about the strength that we've seen in the US and, and maybe that also ties into how interest rate expectations have changed a little bit as well. And, Maybe it's worth just bringing that out because there is quite a divergence now between where the market is, particularly in the US, versus where where the Fed might be in terms of rates. Matt, I don't know if you want to say something on that. Yeah, so what markets are anticipating is for when the Fed meet at the next meeting in May, they're going to raise interest rates by 25 basis points. Now, what's interesting with that when Paul's been talking about bond market volatility is that that should actually take away some of that volatility as um, the Fed has sort of signalled that that's the peak rate that it expects it to get to. So that should help markets become a bit more comfortable with the future path of interest rates. I guess where it becomes interesting, though, where you've highlighted, Jeff, is we're starting to see a divergence between where the Fed are and where the market is. So markets expecting 25 basis point rise, but then come the end of the year, they're ac actually expecting rates to be 100 basis points lower yeah. from where, where they would be. So that's where that divergence it's, starts. It's, it's quite a significant divergence. I was just looking back through time to try and see if we could find other periods where there's been such a divergence. It's really difficult to see in any of the data. It's it's just a an oddity, really, that we have this very significant divergence um, as we are today. If we think about maybe then just looking at some of the the other positives that we've certainly seen over the, the, the period of time, it's inflation. You know, we've touched on it in... in in a lot of um, our content over the past uh, number of, of months, but more on that di disinflation side of things and certainly continuing to see that. Would that be fair to say, George? Absolutely. I think, you know, headline inflation, that's your broadest measure of inflation to coming down. And if we look at the UK, we're expecting in the second half of this year for it to come down quite materially. Um, the challenge for central bankers at this point is core inflation mm. and the contribution which is coming from higher prices in the service sector, housing costs, rental costs, house ownership, and wages, wage pressures, which are going up. So although there's a lot of focus on the central bank in the US at this point, what they're going to do at their May meeting and what they do through the course of the year, where the market's trying to guide them to reducing interest rates, they've still got an inflation challenge to tackle because core's running above target and they need to get there. And that's that core running above target is something that we're seeing in a number of other countries as well at this point. I think the yeah, US, we've got yeah. the same problem yeah. in the UK. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're not there, um, sort of, well, running above target certainly is, but um, that sort of inflation backdrop, I think we were just looking at the maths earlier and there's, mm -hmm. there's some quite material changes that should... Absolutely. work their way through as we go through into the, the, the latter half of the second quarter and certainly into the third quarter of this year. But, you know, I was looking this morning just in the UK front, so yeah, headline level 10.1%, which is, yes, really high. Um, but when we go forward a month, just the maths, last year you've got a 2.5% month-on-month dropping out of the calculations. So that brings down you could actually get below 8% mm -hmm. this time next month or in a couple of months' time. Roll on and do the same. By the end of November, you could be below um, 5%, around the 4 to 5% mark. So that's you know, half of where we are today. Yeah. Yes, there's still a long way to go, and the market's expecting interest rates to go up two, maybe three times of a 0.25% increase. Mm -hmm. So just for uh, context, we're at 4.25% for the UK base rate. So getting towards that 5% level, so that will have interest rates perhaps higher than the level of inflation, which should you know, really have a, a, a material impact on, on the direction of inflation. I suppose forward. as George was, was mentioning there, the headline and core, the dynamics that we're seeing there, 
really where we all see it and where all of our listeners and viewers really will see the impact of inflation probably most acutely at the moment is in in food prices where we've continued over the past couple of months to just see an ongoing acceleration there in, in, in particularly in the UK and I just was maybe throwing out there in a discussion earlier in the week that maybe some of that comes from the energy price problems that we saw just last year and the second order effects that we've discussed but actually it's maybe one of the real second order impacts of of higher energy prices is just what we're now experiencing in in food as well yeah. and also weather weather yeah. impact at the beginning of the year back end of last year it has had an impact on crop yields um and you know uk are um a, a large importer mm-hmm. of, of food relative to a number of, of other other nations so we we do feel that sort of price increase more than potentially others i think you know as we've been been bringing out there inflation should continue to to fall mathematically as we know as you're saying my interest rates much closer to the the peak today than than they were six months ago yeah, and yeah. a very probably more evident where in those rates are having to go as we look forward divergence at the market level there are still however I suppose some challenges for us to try and navigate our, our way through and certainly just looking at the headlines overnight and over the past few days a lot seems to be still around the, the US regional banks and the challenges that they are are facing. Um, I think there is right to say there are headwinds for them and I don't know, it, it, how do people think about the, the challenges there and, and what we've been hearing in recent days? Well, the... The, the challenges, the, there's a lot of challenges out there. Um, to flip it on its head, there's there's a lot of businesses out there who are able to navigate these challenges and actually generate, maintain strong revenue growth and maintain strong profit growth. So yesterday was a great example of a number of companies in the States who were able to actually come out and beat the estimates mm-hmm. which analysts were setting against them, demonstrating that actually business can adapt and you get a positive share price reaction. It was a strong day for the US market yesterday so maybe taking the the other side of the yeah. argument that's a that's a way in which businesses are demonstrating adaptability yeah. and the, the 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 ability to take what is a strong consumer continue generating revenue manage costs prudently in order to generate yeah. a profit but yeah. From, uh, and when we look at the banks and what they've reported when we look at the the large banks in the US they've reported very well they've continued to see deposit inflows benefiting to some extent from the weakness on the smaller regional banks that have have felt significant deposit outflows as those assets go to large banks, but also this continuing this trend of uh, money being attracted to money market funds that are offering a a higher uh, interest rate than what you get on on deposit in banks. So there is still some challenges uh, within the smaller regional banks and you've seen that reflective when we look at market returns or bank returns across the different regions, U.S. banks uh, uh, have been much weaker compared to the likes of Europe, where there's um, certainly the consensus that they're in a much stronger position when we look at the uh, company fundamentals. And we are just talking this morning of Deutsche Bank, which mm. has been in the headlines uh, perhaps uh, vulnerable likes of, uh, or similar to Credit Suisse, that hasn't been the case. And they're actually looking to acquire, and I'm going to get the name wrong. The Numis, the UK, Numis. The UK broker today. And, and I think that just, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small microcosm, but it's, you know, five, six weeks ago from when we were sitting looking at screens and concerns about how Deutsche Bank share price was reacting. And yet there you are, a management team with, confidence in the, f- the future directory of their their business spending 410 million pounds on a on an acquisition of a uk business i think as well jeff just as george was mentioning we're in the u.s earnings season as well and just when you're making the point paul around the large u.s banks when we've actually seen their loan provisions come through in their updated earnings yeah. we're not actually seeing those banks increase yeah. provi- provisions expecting yeah. loan defaults to come through so there's still confidence there in those larger and US banks. And those lo- loan provisions are is basically cash set aside in case of, the of further problems. Of further problems. Yeah. And it also brings to life that sort of differentiation between um, the, the, the systematically important banks, the larger banks mm. in the States, and the regulation which was evolved mm. following uh, 
the, the GFC essentially yeah. and the higher capital adequacy limits that they have to operate um, within yeah. to ensure that they can absorb um, losses of a certain magnitude um, compared to those limits which are set around or regulation limits set around regional yeah. banks. So we're talking we're talking about banks broadly, but it's important to, to segregate what, what sort of banks we're referring to here. And I think also one of the things that we, we haven't touched on, but certainly we have mentioned in, in Morning Markets, is really the the ongoing and resilience is maybe a strong word to use, but the, the strength of the, the labour market across multiple mm -hmm. regions. It's not just a a US issue, it's similar in Europe, similar in the UK, in large parts of Asia as well, that employment has remained very, very robust and we haven't seen a significant pickup in, in unemployment really, despite a large number of the headlines that we see around technology companies. So another uh, factor that certainly has supported activity and if we look at just GDP reports that we've seen, consumption is a big an important part of that, so you can't discount mm -hmm. um, just the strength of, of consumption as at the backdrop at, at this point in time. I wonder, George, maybe if you wanted to just say a few words around how what we've been discussing, the, 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 the way staying calm in volatile markets is the right thing to do, allowing the portfolio managers that we work with and the true potential portfolio solution to, to navigate through that. Do you want to just comment a little bit on some of the the observations from a, a true potential portfolio's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. If we think about you know some of those longer term themes which we can capture within markets, and back end of last year we were talking about adding back into risky assets which have the potential to provide you with a superior long term expected return um, from areas such as such as cash. And the reason we were doing this is because we felt that a number of those headwinds which were central banks raising rates at an aggressive rate to tackle a rising inflationary challenge were starting to moderate on a forward-looking view. So we started to put that money back to work and as Paul mentioned, the delivery of stocks and shares and also bonds year to day, that sort of decision's been rewarded. What's been encouraging in addition to the, the developments which we've made at a portfolio level is the work which our underlying managers have been doing to up the, the sort of quality of the, the stocks and shares which we're holding focusing in those areas which do have the potential to one benefit if you see lower interest rates and financing costs and the, the way in which you value those companies also those companies which are generally bigger in terms of their balance sheets and more resilient if we do see slow and economic growth and also adding to bonds as well bonds which have been a strong performer because markets are forward-looking we're talking there about the potential for US interest rates to come down through the course of this year, markets already pricing that in, so you've seen that that moderation. And also, when you do see those um, challenges in in sp specific pro uh, pockets of the market, such as regional banks, sovereign bonds or government bonds tend to perform better in that type of environment. So our strongest contribution to returns through the course of this year have really came from those managers who've been focused in those areas. But we're, we're, we've got a solution here which is diversified not only by asset class but also manager so one of our other stronger performing managers is one who actually hasn't really been in that space yeah. you know growth stocks in the US or technology stocks or bonds it's actually been a manager who's had a larger exposure to gold as a, an asset class so gold's up about nine percent if we look this year so what we're looking for when we build portfolios is we want diversification of asset class diversification of asset class didn't necessarily work in 2022, but diversification of manager style and approach did because we saw a differentiation in terms of how they delivered. Mm. So when we're building a portfolio and we're making changes, we're doing this on a forward-looking basis. We're doing it on a long-term basis for investors. We're actively managing to address these challenges, but ultimately that diversification puts us in a, in a good position to navigate the challenges. But these opportunities can come through very quickly in a the ability to capture those within a portfolio. So the performance of the portfolios has is, is been positive if we look through the course of the year to date. But of course we always we always want to do more so we'll we'll keep pushing on that. And it's interesting that you, you just you, you bring out gold there as a as an asset class, something that we haven't probably talked a lot about over recent years, but certainly for for that particular man and indeed a number of our managers 
over the past number of months, gold does seem to have been one of the assets that, that managers have been willing to add to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you if you take gold, um, you know, there's no income paid on gold, but you do get an income paid on, say, a government bond, which is another area where you can you can park assets. Now, when interest rates are coming down in the uh, the market, the yield on government bonds is coming down. Therefore, that opportunity cost of holding gold at the expense of, of bonds is is moderated, so it becomes more attractive, and it also becomes more attractive if you if you are seeing. Um, you know, signs of a slowing economy, or if mm. you're seeing signs of a, a weaker dollar, then it it, it, yeah. it it does have a number of aspects which make the asset more attractive. I think and inflation that's, probably sits that's in. a, a good point, George. And we should actually we should reference that just in terms of how currencies have played quite a material impact mm. in in returns over over the year as well. And, and Paul, I don't know if you just some of the data there in terms of how 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 currency markets have performed. Yeah, I think um, what we've seen year to date is we've seen weakness in the US dollar, which mm. is a reverse of what we've experienced um, in 2022. So year to date, the dollar's down around 2%, where we have seen uh, strength is within the pound, which is up around 3%. As The reason behind it is really a narrowing in, in growth expectations or growth outlooks and interest rate differentials as the market as we touched on earlier is pricing in the US interest rate cuts so interest rates peak then to come down whereas in in the UK interest rates are still ticking up they're expected to go up to around five percent so that narrowing in differentials really helps support uh, the pound versus uh, the dollar so the pound's up three percent year to date or four percent since the start of March. No, I think it's for for our investors. It's worth keeping in mind the the magnitude of that currency strength in, in a relatively short period mm -hmm. of time. Um, just as we factored in, as you rightly say, Paul, those big changes mm -hmm. in in interest rate expectations. Maybe then turning it just to to the outlook and thinking about what we as a team are are thinking about and considering over the the weeks and months ahead. Matt, I don't know whether what's front and centre of of your mind as you look to the to the future. Then, yeah, um, sort of stealing some of the lines Paul's just used before, but we're really just thinking about the mix of growth, inflation, and therefore interest rates and those yeah. dynamics and how they all come together. Um, as we've talked about, we've mentioned what's happening in the US with the the regional banks. What are you know the consequences of that? What's going to play out yeah. um, when? We originally saw SVB and Signature Bank run into those problems. We saw a tightening of credit conditions, but actually what we've seen since is those relax and those come down. So credit standards aren't tightening to the, maybe where, what we would have expected them to have done given what happened within the US banking sector. So that, you know, still provides consumers with credit to go out and spend and, um, raise GDP growth in the US, which once again comes back to yeah. potentially given the Federal and, and Reserve I think a problem. it's worth contextualising that in the sense that whilst they did tighten initially and, and loosen, as you say, it remains pretty much a paramount focus for us to see how credit conditions are likely to evolve and, as you say, that, that provision of credit. Yeah, so that's something as a team we're all keeping an eye on. Yeah. I know our managers who we've spoken to in the recent past have also mentioned it as being a key indicator in terms of what they're expecting for going forward for the yeah. rest of the year. And then, as we said, with central banks, they're always important. Um, and just, you know, the signalling that we get from them, their forward guidance, yeah. if any, to come through. But as we were mentioning earlier this morning, Jeff, you know, they've all been pretty significantly wrong yeah. over the past number of years since the pandemic really so just looking at those factors and you know ultimately what does that mean for asset markets and I suppose Paul as well bringing out some of the the survey evidence that we're seeing there's there's really something for everyone to, to sort of grab yeah. onto within those those data points I mean the there's so much data out there and you can really paint various different pictures and it's just trying to look uh, and take it again take a step back uh, and look at things um, on balance. What is the direction of travel? There's, you know, sentiment has been quite weak. 
uh, survey sentiment, um, but we are, when we look at the hard data, there is, is pockets of um, strength. When we looked at the housing data this week, it seems to have stabilised after deteriorating over the last 12 months. We've seen, in, you know, improvements, continued improvements in services sector uh, within Europe, but also in the US. On the manufacturing side in the US, we've kind of seen a stabilisation and actually a slight tick up although there is um, data out there that would contradict that. Uh, and so from our perspective, looking over the next six, 12 months, yes, we have quite a, a, a strong view that inflation will continue to fall, this disinflation view, but it's what's the direction of travel for economic growth? Do we see economic growth deteriorate as those credit standards or conditions tighten further, which they may do, is often a lagged impact of um, stress within the banking sector and what that then goes on to mean uh, for, for credit standards. Um, so does growth deteriorate? And therefore, if it does, then we're probably a bit more cautious on our equity allocation, a bit more defensive. Or are we starting to see pockets that things are stabilising and actually the market will look through any short-term deterioration and actually think about the next cycle or the upswing to yeah. economic growth. And I think there's, there's there's a couple of really interesting and important points that, that you say that the, the data is mixed. It's very difficult to take a view potentially one way or the other in yeah. that scenario. But as you've mentioned, Matt, as well, central banks got their forecasts dramatically wrong and that is the, 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 the market in terms of, of inflation. But that really plays into how we think about portfolio construction, that we want to have a balance of factors within the, the portfolios for that very reason. It, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to predict what the future is going to be. Absolutely. We can look at, you know, we can make point estimates six months out, 12 months out, but the pathway to get there is never linear. There's always going to be surprises along the way, and that's why it's important to, to have a diversified investment um, by diversification we're not just talking about we've got x percent in stocks and shares and x percent in bonds we use uh, currencies we use alternative assets which give you the ability to take a directional view um, within select asset classes we look at the way in which managers invest whether they're buying individual companies or whether they're buying broader indices so we invest in very different mm -hmm. ways and we package this together in one solution which is actively managed for clients to one aligned with that long-term view which we've got because having a, a long-term reference point is important to maintain that that focus and have conviction in that but we want the ability to, to be active and navigate challenges as they arise and get on, get on the front foot to put clients in the best position. I think the other thing as well that we use um, just given the uncertainty is we use quite a robust valuation framework mm. and we sort of look at those assets that are maybe overvalued compared to their own history or relative to other assets so we can also rely on our valuation framework yeah. to you know help navigate the uncertainty yeah. and I think that's an important aspect that to bring out because you know if we look at you know all the challenges and stress tests that portfolios have had thrown at them over the last number yeah. of years if we actually look at what you're paying for an asset relative to say a 20-year history let's yeah. give it a long-term context the valuations are, are, are actually quite attractive for areas like fixed income for certain parts of the equity market. So for a long-term investor, that's a better footing to, to go in. And it, it, it's also, you know, we're talking about attraction of assets there from a total return perspective in terms of what we can deliver for, in terms of capital growth. But actually, we, we run two income portfolios as well. And if we look at the income environment, which has been created from yields on bonds moving higher and then the sort of equities which we're able to to, to identify and, 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 and access within the portfolios. The income environment is, is also been been one which has been very healthy over the last twelve months and we've got a, a you know an attractive outlook on that area as well. And I think that's the the key point really from what we wanted to to, to bring across today is that markets aren't really linear. There's a lot of volatility that one has to navigate mm -hmm. as part and parcel of, of investment. But going back to, to what you said right at the start, Paul, it's about 
keeping perspective, mm -hmm. staying calm, reassessing it, using the frameworks that are out there to help us navigate through those challenges for our, our end clients. And I think one of the, the sort of the concluding comments that we might have is that really volatility is something you have to live with as part and parcel of investment. But it's about being able to, to take that step back and not being panicked yeah. at, at that point in time because we do know it can have quite detrimental impacts on on, on the longer term journey that we're seeking to achieve. Absolutely, I think, you know, part of investing is it's gonna be volatile, as you say, you're gonna have these periods of stress. There's countless, over uh, the lifetime of investing, you'll have periods of stress, the most recent one being the banking crisis. We've had COVID, we had Ukraine, but it's how we construct portfolios that's really important to really smooth out the journey, yeah. but then have the right managers in place to identify the opportunities and to make sure that the returns are delivered yeah. for clients. And I think that's that's been a great way to bring to life today the problems that we saw only five, six weeks ago, how the market focused in on them, but how returns have certainly evolved from that period. So thank you to George, Matt and Paul for, for their contributions today. And thank you for, for joining us for episode 165. If there are um, questions that you have, please do log into the app and please speak to your advisor as well. But many thanks for joining us today. Thank you.